welcome everyone, warmly welcome to our first conversation. And we're fortunate today to have two special guests. Um, and I welcome to you, Drs. Shabazz, Dr. Demetria Shabazz, and Dr. Amalkar Shabazz, co-founders of the Racial Equity Amherst Task Force, among other things. <laughs> Both the Dr. Shabazz are scholars and educators, as well as community activists and longtime residents of Amherst. Dr. Demetria Shabazz has taught at University of Massachusetts, Hampshire, and Bay Path in the fields of communication studies, communication, Afro-American studies, and film studies, with a focus on the role of media in history for communities of color. She's president of the board of Amherst Media and a member of the town Board of Registrars. Dr. Amilkar Shabazz teaches history and Africana studies at the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of African American Studies. He came here as chair of the department and served in that capacity at University of Massachusetts, he served in that capacity for many years, and he serves now as the interim chair. He served as the faculty advisor to the chancellor for diversity and excellence. He continues to teach in the department with an emphasis on the political economy of social and cultural movements, education and public policy. He has many publications and national honors, but here at home, we are recognizing him as the man who sparked the recognition of Juneteenth Emancipation Day as a state holiday in Massachusetts as of this June of this year. We are really fortunate to have Dee and Amilcar with us. Many of us have been following the task force in town council meetings and on Facebook, and now even Twitter, but now we have a chance to go deeper, to better understand the task force's goals, and I expect over time to identify common interests and concerns. I note that both the task force and our JCA SEDEC initiative were responses to the anguish felt by the murder of George Floyd by the police. So we'll begin a few logistical notes. We are recording this by agreement between the hosts and guests and uh, the continued participation you're continuing in the meeting is, will be considered acceptance of that recording uh, in, your, in your participation. To guide this conversation, uh, in the hour 15 minutes we have, Jeff and I uh, have a series of questions that we'll ask to you, Dee and Amilkar. Those of you in the audience who have additional questions should use the chat function to send those questions where they'll be monitored by Karen Levine and she'll ask questions in the end of the last segment of, of our time. Um, and we hope to get to most of them. Judith, Judith Lois Child is our timekeeper. I understand that Dee has to leave at five o'clock. She had a previous commitment uh, at Amherst Media, but Amilcar has graciously agreed to continue with us to 515. We're all new at this uh, large scale Zooming, so we hope we pull this off without uh, any technical mishaps. <laughs> and uh, let's begin. Jeff, would you? Start. Sure. Yeah. So we'd like to begin this conversation by stating something um, that may be obvious, but needs to be um, explicitly stated nonetheless. As we have read the racial equity task force goals and objectives for the town manager, the overall context <clears throat> as stated in the first three paragraphs is both compelling and critical. We are in full agreement that racial equity and social justice <laughs> concerns need to be woven into every facet of town government and town management and, and government policy. If we are to become a community whose social, political, educational, living, health, and ecological environments are closer to what the late great John Lewis called, quote, the beloved community. So again, welcome Brother Shabazz and Dee, and thank you again for joining us. To begin with, could you give us a little history on the Racial Equity Task Force 
its goals and objectives, and what has been accomplished thus far? Well, first off, thank you all for, for having us and giving us this opportunity to really have a conversation um, and dialogue with you all about um, you know, things that have been really important to my husband and I as um, you know, residents here in this community for now over a little over 13 years. Um, we, when we married <laughs> and, and assumed this partnership, we did so also as activists. And so this is something that isn't new to us. This is something that, that we live. So thank you again. Um, the Racial Equity Task Force came out of, as you mentioned, Jeff, out of the most recent, uh, what I see is a, a crisis of conscience and democracy here in the nation and in this community. And uh, what I mean by that, certainly the George Floyd, uh, murder of George Floyd um, brought things into stark relief as to, you know, bringing national and local attention to um, why we say Black Lives Matter, in that this is um, uh, an assertion and a validation of who we are when we see someone like George Floyd murdered uh, horribly uh, in the streets. And this has, of course, happened historically since uh, Black people have been brought to the shores and elsewhere. So um, it brought it into stark relief and my husband and a few others in the community began to bring that national discussion into a more localized uh, context. And one of the things that we um, wanted to really look at and investigate um, and revisit is the topic of policing locally. And so along with our friend and fellow activist, uh, Gazi Kaya Nikosi, um, we began to have these conversations. Um, they mentioned that last year um, with the fifth uh, district um, representative, Shalini uh, Bal Balmel, um, they had a conversation with the police chief, Chief Livingstone, around um, issues of policing and um, public safety, really to do with uh, mental health, you know, maybe um, trying to provide some alternatives to uh, police going out on wellness checks, that type of thing. And so they shared that conversation with us. They said they wanted to revisit that. And we agreed that we would be a part of that conversation because we shared the same concerns. And so we set up um, initially this um, dialogue with the police chief. Um, Pat DeAngelis became part of the conversation because Pat is, uh, um, I consider a friend of mine, and we were having very similar conversations. So Pat, um, Shalini, my husband and I, and Gazit Kaya um, arranged this conversation with the police chief. What ended up happening is that um, we had a larger forum, and when we thought of, well, this larger forum should represent the people. And so we invited uh, folks to participate. And when I think of, and when my, my husband and I think of, because we've had these conversations, when we think of the people and having a, a more participatory democracy, uh, we think of people's assemblies as a part of that organizational uh, process and having um, folks be engaged in some way. And so we called it our first People's Assembly. And that was on July 4th, which we felt was, uh, of course, really appropriate. Um, so out of that, we decided to have a space and an organization 
uh, where we could share information with others in the town who were now interested and, and more fully engaged um, in those conversations around, around policing and call it uh, the Racial Equity Task Force of Amherst. And that's how it began. And we've been organizing ever since. The whole summer has been filled with um, meetings, um, um, different discussions, and it's, it's been energizing, uh, yet frustrating at times. Um, because, you know, when we think of our current uh, town government, there are some real problems and challenges and barriers to that notion of participatory democracy, almost the antithesis of what a people's assembly should be regarded as. And uh, just to give you an example, what a people's assembly is in Jackson, Mississippi, they formed um, a people's assembly uh, type of process to begin um, electing uh, local government leaders. And, um, you know, it worked. Other people's assemblies where we have seen work uh, is in the UK. And for those of you who were uh, in uh, a part of the environmental um, movement, um, the, um, I think it's the, the extinction or I forget the name, but it's the people's ex uh, something extinction. And they've been really successful at using people's assemblies as a means of organizing. So just the kind of short of it, um, that's, um, that's where we get the name, the racial equity task force and the people's assembly as our organizing principle and process. Thank you. Um, that, um... I, I really like the idea of participatory democracy for us old new leftists. That's an endearing term. Um, but it does lead to the, to, to, to the, the, the next question, which is, um, what do you see as the challenges or obstacles uh, of the task force? And, and I note that, that things are changing almost by the day. Um, articles in the newspaper today about the town um, joining, um, and I don't know this organization called GARE, but um, so, so uh, it's, it's like this is in real time, but I'd be curious to hear what, your what you feel the challenges are uh, or the obstacles at the current moment. Sure, um, I can speak to that and then I'm sure the other Dr. Shabazz will have some thoughts on it. Um, what has been evident from the beginning, the People's Assembly uh, type of process and organization is meant to happen in person. Um, and uh, really it has to do with, you know, uh, having certain discussions, trying to assess priorities, right, and then creating an action based on those priorities. Since we're not in person, all of this is happening just as we are, we are here virtually uh, and remotely. Um, so that is a bit of an impediment in having those kind of immediate type of conversations. However, the technology as we are here allows for more people theoretically to participate uh, if they have the technology. And so for those who don't have um, the technology or unable to work with that technology, it makes organizing um, using a people's assembly method a bit more difficult difficult. So uh, one of the ways in which we've tried to work with those challenges is also dependent upon technology, sending emails. Um, I've made phone calls, particularly to elders, to try to um, get them to weigh in those types of ways of communicating. But there's that challenge. The other challenge has to do with structurally just within our town and our town government. As you said, Jeff, almost daily, there is um, another, <laughs> another announcement being made. Mind you, none of those announcements, I am certain, would not have occurred, nor the conversations about racial equity and social justice, had it not been for this summer's activism with the Racial Equity Task Force. Um, I can assure you, because um, we have uh, 
you know, it's been difficult, but just one of the obstacles in terms of our own town government, um, and this is why we, we have resorted to or we embrace the People's Assembly process, is that when you think of not only Black, Indigenous, people of color, but working class folks, uh, folks with small children, et cetera, our government does not engender kind of civic engagement in a very convenient way. So we're talking about staying up, you know, um, sometimes past 10, 11 o'clock just to have public comment and for folks to hear our voices. And so sometimes there are moments in which we have organized and people have simply texted us or emailed us and said, hey D or Milcar, I have to go put my kid to bed. So this is what I wanna say. So can you make sure to say it in some way? So it, you know, those challenges exist, but they exist because of how our town government, our local government is, is set up. Uh, in addition, when you think of, when we do weigh in, there has been a recent example where the people have spoken um, and our town government has simply kind of ignored what we have said. And so, you know, not feeling um, validated when you did try to participate, you know, you did try to um, either through public comment or through a letter to your um, town counselor um, and your voice wasn't heard. You know, it wasn't considered. So I think these are ongoing problems. And uh, what you're referring to with the GARE um, program, that is, uh, we, we are still looking at that. I've, did, I've done some research where it's been used elsewhere, Brookline, uh, Massachusetts being one of the spots where the program is being used. It looks like this is a, a, a very managerial, type of approach to diversity. And that is concerning because what we are trying to do is, you know, as a goal is have some type of collective process where the people's voice is heard, is, um, is considered and helps to shape local town policy. And that is, that is really concerning because in many ways, what it looks like to me on the surface is that this is a, a kind of a public relations type of move and that it is um, managing dissent instead of hearing differences uh, of opinion and other voices. Thank you. I think Jamie has the next question. Um, <clears throat> Well, I, just in following up, I, my next question concerns the police. This, I first was aware our committee was, we were wanting to learn about uh, policing in Amherst. And I started with the um, recording of that uh, June 11th meeting that you had. Um, and I felt you've opened up a lot of things. And I wonder if, um, how, to, how can the town, reimagine policing. I think there's a great support for it. I, there was just an Amherst Forward email saying we need to rethink how we're doing policing. Um, and I reading on the comments on your on the racial equality, uh, racial equity Facebook page. Um, so there's support for so how to do it. We do have the council. I wonder if there's something like a people's assembly that could be a parallel focus on police or what are your thoughts? Well, um, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of talk, um, but as we would say back in the old civil rights movement days, you know, it's also about walking the walk. Who's, who's ready to walk the walk? Um, I'm struck by the fact that the, the People's Assembly we had with, uh, with the chief, with Chief Livingstone and, and uh, Captain Teen, and I mean, and right there, the chief is saying, that you know, when when presented with with the issue of the need 
to have public voice, public feedback, transparency with the people about our police department. He said right there in the presence of, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of Lynn Greismer and the, and the town councilors and, and the town manager there that he welcomes. This wasn't somebody saying, oh, we've got a perfect police department and there's, you know, and, 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 and if you want transparency with our police department, we are insulted because we're doing everything so wonderfully and blissfully and, and uh, there's no need to reform or reimagine anything about the police. We're great. We're perfect. He didn't come off like that. Mm -hmm. He came off very humble, very matter of fact. Yes, our complaint process, you know, the, the Boston, com, uh, former Boston commissioner studied it in the aftermath of the Blarney blowout and said, what police com complaint process? When we asked where, where were the complaints, <laughs> they told we didn't have any, they didn't have any complaints. Meanwhile, the students are all telling the interviewers from the, uh, the project that, oh yes, I complained, oh yes, I filed my complaint, oh yes, I told, you know, but they had no complaints to show. Okay, hundreds of, over a hundred and something students arrested. Some of them feeling very much that the, the way they were handled were pretty rough and un, unjustified. You know, their cell phones broken and, 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 and uh, you know, the, uh, 500 pepper balls uh, uh, shot at people. But we've never pulled our gun before. We've never pulled a weapon before in 40 years. And there's no complaints. So we had to call, the, the, you know, we had to call this out. Not trying to be ugly, not trying to be troublemakers, except in the sense of John Lewis, some good trouble. Yeah, we might stir up some good trouble, but that's all. And, and so he had to admit, and humbly so, that he would welcome some type of civilian oversight, some type of citizen oversight, review, input process. It would seem to me if, the, if we had a serious town government, the next day, there should have been a press release going out. The next day, there should have been processes going out to say, hey, we're forming a civilian review board. We're forming a, a, a commission on police practices. You know, we're trying to develop the mission and we're trying to develop the, the focus of it and, and this, how it fits within our overall strategic plan. The next day, things should have been moving. But these people don't, you know, they, they, have, no, they have no urgency about anything. Mm. They don't, they don't, you know, it's just, it's just very upsetting. I'm sorry, y'all. It's just, but it's very upsetting that you come off of a meeting where the actual, where the chief is humble enough to tell you, yes, we could use this. Yes, this can help us be a better, to better serve our community, to hear from folks. And nothing, nothing moves. Nothing moves but go into, you know, form some, some uh, uh, alliance uh, uh, after the, the way the Brookline people are doing and, and announcing this and announcing that, you know. So I, it's a lot of talk out there, folks. But, you know, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an old soldier in this and, and I'm less impressed with the talk. I'm, I'm interested in when are we gonna walk the walk? Because, uh, you know, this should have already been done. You know, we can re we reading about people being appointed in Northampton. And we got, you know, a counselor here, got the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the chutzpah or whatever you say to say, you know, well, if it's anything concerning Northampton, you know, I, I, I'm not interested in anything in Northampton for, for Amherst. And you can quote me on it, put her name in the, in the thing, you know, in the quotation, put her name in there. It doesn't interest me if it's from Northampton. Come on, come on. So, you know, again, it's a lot of talk, but then when the rubber hits the road, I, just, I don't see anything moving. I don't see anything moving. It's week after week after week after week. It's more little show. It's more little, you know, announcement from, from uh, Amherst backward. I mean, Amherst forward. It's, you know, announcement from, from here, announcement from there. No, 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 no. I'm not impressed. It's when the rubber hits the road. The chief himself has said he welcomes some input. He, well, he knows he's in a very, in a very astute and town, educated town, a lot of people here that can give real constructive feedback on how to, to move in a different direction, how to reimagine. He knows that. He's a smart man. 
and he welcomes the, some, the feedback and constructive feedback. It'll strengthen his hand in dealing with some of his own, his own force to better impress upon them why they need to be at that training session, why they need to do X, Y, and Z, why they need to file better reports, why they need to handle people better, why they need to be responsive to people's complaints. It strengthens his hand. But, you know, but I begin to wonder, do you want to strengthen his hand? So a lot of talk is out there, folks, but I'm interested in when are we going to walk the walk? Thank you. Thanks, Amilcar. I'm, um, well, my, my next question is, sort of, is maybe related. Um, what's been the reaction to, in town, in the community, to um, your effort to, to racial equity Amherst? Are there other organizations that we want to join on? I mean, one answer is to build a bigger, uh, you know, force that says this has to happen. That's our answer. That's, that's why we're here. That's why you know, we've connected with Defund 413, that D can talk more about the upcoming People's Assembly that we're organizing. We 100% agree with you. If we, you know, uh, I had a, uh, an old soldier that I, I, I studied under back when I was an undergraduate in Austin, Texas, uh, a woman named Dorothy Turner, I want to say her name, she's passed on, but uh, she, was a, she was a true soldier. And she said, you know, Shabazz, there's only two things that's respected in this country by the people with power and that's money and numbers. And so if you don't have the money, you gotta organize the numbers. And so I think that's, that's really where, where we are. Um, and, um, and I think that, um, that you know, Dee can speak to more of that. Well, thanks for helping um, spread that word. I um, certainly think, um, I'd like to follow up on that. Um, uh, Jeff, I think. Yeah. Um, so as we from the JCA commit um, to learning from the leaders of the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color community in Amherst, can you comment on what you think are the most important elements of coalition building? Most definitely. Um, you know, the important elements of, of coalition building, particularly right now, is a shared vision of community and what we want this world to look like. Um, you know, I, I say all the time, do we really wanna have these conversations 10 years from now? Is that, do we wanna be back in this moment? Because if we are not working together, you know, everyone, that's where we're gonna be. And our grandchildren, our neighbors, our friends and family, they're going to suffer. And when we think about, you know, <laughs> he who shall not be named, <laughs> um, the orange one, um, when we think about him, you know, he's, he's just uh, a symptom. And we have uh, white supremacist ideas that are shaping our interactions, shaping our policies, shaping our structures and systems that we are in right now, both locally and nationally. And so we have to do this work together. Uh, one night when we were all on um, a town council meeting, it was, it was actually the, one of the brightest moments I have had in Amherst where my neighbor to the left of me and her son, they were on the town council meeting and um, we were all talking about the same issues. My neighbor to the right of me that is you know, leading the South Hadley vigil. And then our newest neighbor further down the road was also on. And so we wanted to rename our street Freedom Town, you know, I mean, it was, it was just really, you know, and it hadn't been planned. Um, it hadn't been coordinated except with my neighbor to the left. And just to have that moment where, oh, we all want change. You know, so, so maybe 
this is the time in which we're going to get there but it has to be intergenerational you know i i look at the the defund 413 young people and their energy and their ability to uh do the 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 research and the number crunching that is totally needed but what's also needed is our collective wisdom as older folks who have been in this community and in this world for quite a while we have also been a part of different movements that is is totally needed right now to shore up these young people and not have them feeling that this is all for naught and that they're doing something that is totally uh, out of line and out of step with the previous generation. This is the continuation of the struggle. And we have to revisit that until racism, until, you know, isms are, are gone. We have to revisit that and it, it needs us there. The movement needs us. We need to be when we can standing in the streets with these young people. When we can, we need to be up late at night on town council if that's, if that's our march, if that's our protest. We need to do what we can because it needs us. Anti-racism work needs us now. It's not something that's just an event with George Floyd, and it's not something that's national. One of the, the things that the town council, one of the town councilors, um, well, a couple of them had said that, oh, well, this is simply a reaction and a response to what's going on nationally. No, it's not. All it did was bring us together and remind us of what is the struggle locally. And the struggle locally has always been for, for BIPOC people, and dare I say people who are at the margins in other ways, such as the poor and the working class, the undocumented, that when they are confronted oftentimes with the police, it is profiling, it is harassment, and it is ill treatment. And so what has been one of the responses to the racial equity task force? And I always say, my husband and I, we are not attorneys. You know, we can refer you maybe to an attorney, but people are once again, because they've done this before, they come out and they say, I was stopped. This is what occurred. Um, my daughter was, was handcuffed. This is what happened. My son, I had to go and meet him in the streets because I was afraid that something would happen. You know, these things occur all the time. And what, what we don't get is that reporting mechanism that my husband talked about. What we don't get is when people who identify as white, those aren't things that you experience on a daily basis. Right. And we do as a collective group, and we hear those stories and we commiserate, and oftentimes we don't go further in the reporting because we're afraid of some type of um, you know, uh, retribution in some way. It's risky, in other words. And that is, that is what we live, even as the privileged people we are with education, you know, achieve some, some level of middle class status, and we're still profiled. I've been stopped. My husband's been stopped. Our son has been stopped. And these are our concerns and fears within this community. And so what we are trying to do is create policies and practices that won't only just benefit our children and friends and neighbors who are people of color, but they will benefit everyone, particularly the, you know, the, the wellness checks and having someone who is fully trained to handle a mental health crisis instead of someone with a badge and a gun and a uniform, you know, 
These are things that can be put in place to benefit everyone in the community. So the response has been, for the most part, pretty positive. There have been folks who have uh, critiqued, particularly the, the police defunding, you know, as many people have questions about it. They're not fully saying no, no way, but they, they do have um, critiques and I think that's healthy. I think we need to figure out what would be a system if it's to defund or it's to have some type of um, uh, overview board. Um, we have to decide what's best for our community and we have, to, we have to do that together. But you have to hear from the people who are experiencing this treatment, not just those who benefit from the protection of property, et cetera, within the community. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I could follow up on one other thing that we touched upon, um, and um, and that is that um, in the um, in the task force uh, text to the town manager um, around performance objectives, um, one of the things mentioned, and I'll just quote this, is quote a process for learning about the experience of many Amherst residents. We are aware that in Amherst, Amherst in many ways is a segregated community um, where black indigenous people of color have vastly different experiences, which you just referred to, um, both of you, um, in town functioning than white residents. What we would be interested in learning um, and constructing a process so that learning about these differences can occur. So what, from your point of view, what would that process look like? I think it's, it, there are many, many facets to this. Um, you know, uh, D got a call from the town and they were asking her to take time out to analyze a, a survey. Now she has a, a PhD in the social sciences and, um, you know, constructing, doing this kind of work is, is something that, that she has studied, has done. And, um, you know, yeah, you want me to, you ask me to volunteer to something, but then also in a way that kind of implicates my name into something because then people can reference, oh, you know, uh, Dr. D. Chavez, you know, vetted, vetted this survey instrument. So, you know, you had to kind of just say, well, well, hold on, you know, I don't know about this. But um, this is, you know, that's sort of one way, surveys, focus groups. Uh, for us, it's a community organizing issue, okay? And that's where the concept of people's assembly comes in. Um, there's something at uh, Hampshire College called the Ahmed Akbal, uh, Akbal series. Maybe some of you even knew him or met, met him before. Um, but um, in the, uh, one of the Akbal series uh, um, guests that they brought out one year, uh, keynoters they brought out was uh, the daughter of a man that, uh, that I worked with in the movement for, for many years, met him first. Uh, back in the early 1980s, a man named Shokwe Lumumba, attorney Shokwe Lumumba. And um, uh, his son now is um, the mayor. And uh, his daughter, Rukia, is a great activist herself. Now, both of them were, you know, just little little kids running around <laughs> when I was back there working with their, with their father but, uh, and, uh, and staying at their house in Jackson when they first moved there. Uh, doing work with them. And, um, and so, you know, it, it's just um, inspiring to me to see that generation come up and, and move things, uh, uh, you know, keep the struggle going and, and some different things than we were doing back in, back in the day. But, um, but, one, but this process of the People's Assembly is really a distillation of, um, of a lot of um, of a lot of things that we were studying and we were trying to implement. We were very inspired in the People's Assembly by knowing the work of a man uh, uh, named, and I'll cite him as kind of the intellectual figure within that movement, but it was the, the people of Guyana 
And the man was a man named Walter Rodney. Walter and Patricia Rodney were, were major figures in fighting throughout the Caribbean, the, the Pan-African world. Um, and uh, uh, Walter was killed by a bomb uh, in Guyana. Patricia is, is a social worker and a professor in Atlanta uh, um, uh, and still lives today and has the Walter Rodney Memorial Foundation. Um, but they, that was how he organized and the people organized the Working People's Alliance in, in Guyana. And so many of us you know, knew of the work of, of, of Rodney. Many of us followed the work, uh, the kind of organizing work of the man I'm named for, Amilcar Cabral in Cape Verde. So, you know, there are these different processes that we lived through, we studied, we worked with in the 70s and 80s and attempted to, to, to implement and develop here. And then it, it, it became the children of us, of us that, that took that to another level um, and the people that took that to another level in Jackson. Actually, while Shokri was still alive, he, he back when we were working in the, in the 80s, we, our thoughts on electoral politics were in, in the United States of America were, were like, uh -uh. Do we, you know, that's, that, that, that's not our form of activism. Um, and, uh, but, you know, over time, and especially as we, we moved back into the South and, and Shokwe left Detroit and moved to, uh, to Jackson, um, people came to him and said, hey, man, no, we need you to step up. And, uh, you know, uh, and so he did run and he first was a city on the city council. And, um, and it was through the people's assembly process that they organized what his platform was, what he, you know, was going to go there to represent, what he would work to accomplish for his constituency. Then he got elected to, uh, to mayor. And it was the same process developed, going to the people, opening the space up. To, to hear from people, what are the problems? What do you, do you want, you know, is our strategy, for example, in, in developing uh, Jackson is that, okay, we're gonna give major tax breaks to corporations to come down here and we're gonna build up all the infrastructure to invite these corporations to come down here and presumably they're gonna give us jobs. They're going to give us these jobs, and that'll be great for, for Jackson, and which had been kind of the strategy of so-called economic development over and over, years and years and years, is, you know, give away the bank, let these corporations come down, pay no taxes, ad infinitum, and, and, hope, and presumably we get some good jobs out of it. And the people said, no, you know, they'd seen that. They'd, they'd seen that script before, and they're like, no, that's not what we want to see for economic development. And so they began to develop this concept of cooperatives, people's cooperatives, and how to find ways to, to invest in the people to create the kinds of enterprises and jobs and things that, that takes care of people and put people to productive employment. And it's not perfect and it has, a, you know, uh, um, they're not all nirvana, but some things they've done have garnered attention around the world in terms of the, the, the whole cooperative movement and the whole uh, um, different form of, of, of economic development they've been working out there in, in, uh, in Jackson. But, um, but this was a product of going in to the people. And so when, we, when they had the ECBAL and, um, and we brought in Rukia, Rukia came in as the speaker. Um, she took a couple of hundred you know, people, Hampshire students, staff, faculty, we came there from UMass, and she took us into kind of an example of the process and just took over the space and involved us in how they organized. And, and so that further kind of impressed on DNI. We were both there at Hampshire that day. That kind of impressed upon us uh, that. And so when this moment jumped off and people were saying, what are we doing and where are we? That's where for DNI it has been a moment to really kind of reflect on on that, that type of process and say, okay, let's approach this from a community organizing uh, uh, standpoint and let's approach it with a, a, a kind of people's assembly, a kind of grassroots cooperative uh, empowerment uh, uh, strategy to really bring, find ways to, to bring forth the, the voice, the will of people here because um, 
you know, and others can do the survey instruments, others can do focus groups, others can do uh, petitions, others can do, you know, other kinds of things. But that right now is how we're trying to approach uh, uh, bringing forth that. that and, and, and what it has been, I'll say one other thing, what it has been that's really the first thing that's been um, an important discussion for, uh, for those of us working to do this is this term, term BIPOC. BIPOC, because what we found, you know, just running into the community, oh, we, we want to bring BIPOC people together. We want to bring BIPOC. We want to hear from BIPOC people. We want to organize BIPOC people. Like, who, is that a disease? Is, you, is there a vaccination for that? What's, what, you know, what, is, what is BIPOC? What is, is that some other, is that the vaccination for COVID? You know, so, you know, we don't want to just jump in with, with more verbiage and more you know jargon and and the latest little flavor now so we have to kind of break that down and what as we break it down we we really first of all start with the black the first part of that bipoc black is not a homogenous thing here in town there are folks like kathleen anderson she likes to use the term that she's a historical african american right michael burkhardt you've heard her say that she's an american descendant of slavery <clears throat> she didn't just come here off the boat generation two ago from, from Haiti or Jamaica or Cape Verde. She has, and her family have been here and got here on the boat back right, right after the Mayflower. Right? That, that, you know, they've been, we've been, we were here on the first boats. And we're descendants of slavery in this country. So she likes to, you know, brand that piece out there. And I think it's important to brand, not a hierarchy. It's not a hierarchy of blackness. We are the most oppressed black folks. We, we're, we're done with the uh, oppression Olympics here, right? We're done with that and all the heteropatriarchy and all of that. We're done with that. So, it, but it's really about specifying the identity that you hold space for and what you're coming forth to represent. So we have a lot here just under that black rubric. Cape Verdean, Haitian, Jamaican, uh, Trinidadian, uh, Nigerian, uh, Somalian, Ethiopian, uh, different groups out of Ethiopia, Omara, uh, uh, Amhar Amharic. I mean, it's very diverse when you say black here in this town, okay? And then indigenous, that's very diverse the nature of indigene indigeneity as it is lived and experienced here in Amherst. And we got to respect that. And we got to open, you know, find ways to open a space for that conversation. And then, oh, Lord, have mercy, people of color. Okay. And we've got, you know, people of color, I, I like to say, we're, we're the shortest road in Amherst, the little road we live on. And, and yet we have become the most diverse. We got per Peruvian. We've got South, different Southeast Asian folks on this block. My neighbors are on the other side of the street. Dee talked about the left and the right. On the other side, it's from Sweden. And tell you, they, you know, they just got off the boat here from Sweden uh, a couple of generations ago. They miss slavery, but they understand it's, that, that there's white supremacy here. And, uh, and then on and on and on. We've got, you know, it's a very diverse block. But, um, but all of that to say, the first thing we're doing as we move to organize is to unpack a term like BIPOC and really find a process by which we open a space where all racially marginalized, racially oppressed groups in this town can find their voice and come forth to express what they are experiencing and what they would like to see town government and this town in general do. And that means on some level having translation. There are ways within Zoom um, to have translation, not only in the chat, but um, you can have it as, as part of the, you know, the, the what is it, it as it, you know, you, the text to, to you know, voice to text Caption. and captions. You can also have um, a separate part of Zoom, another Zoom where it does translation. There are many ways to do this. It would take a bit of investment to formalize it within town government, but I think it's worth it as our town becomes much more diverse. And we say 
we value diversity, again, it goes back to walking the walk. If we value diversity, then we should value civic engagement of everyone. All the re residents deserve to be heard because documented, undocumented, who are also part of our town, we all pay taxes. And so not having that opportunity to voice your concerns and participate and help shape priorities for this town government is absolutely undemocratic unacceptable. and unacceptable. So I'm noticing the time. We have about 10 minutes left before you leave, D. And um, I'm, I'm going to ask a question that that 10 minutes is not any way, shape, or form um, adequate enough. But I've got to be honest with you, I'm, I'm dying to ask this question, so I'm going to ask it. Um, and uh, it's a little bit long-winded, but uh, if, if you would just bear with me. Um, the task force forces position paper on goals for the town manager is a comprehensive document, which argues that racial and social equity should be at the center of most, if not all, town policy decisions and consequent implementations. As such, it would appear that these goals offer an underlying philosophy and strategy for a structural reparations program in Amherst. This is certainly not the reparations concept that William Darity and Kirsten Mullen um, advocate, but it's more along the lines of Evanston, Illinois. Can you please comment on that idea and possibility? So, um, having a lens towards racial equity towards equity in general because um you know a lot of the things that we also outline in there have to do with um immigrant communities the undocumented etc um definitely has to do with reparations and when we place that at the center of anything how how we move in this town not only as some you know um uh idyllic way of being but also in terms of economics you know if we were to really look at um businesses owned by again writ large by the bipoc community that are in Amherst, not in Hadley, not in surrounding areas that are owned and operated by people of color. Um, there are very few. And the chamber, un up until this summer, did not have a comprehensive list of businesses owned by women, LGBTQ, persons nor by people of color up until this summer and i saw them because i subscribe to everyone's newsletter i want to be civically engaged um up until this summer did not have a comprehensive list well good for them that they finally have a list of who has reported out that they are a person of color or belong to any other uh, minority community. The problem is, is that had we, as a community, whether you're the chamber, whether you're the town council, um, just in staffing the town government, had we looked through the lens about social justice and equity, we would have looked to well, maybe, you know, we have two African Americans who are currently employed as the staff in the town. That's great. Are there other folks that maybe we could recruit 
to our small hamlet here uh, to help in, in terms of diversifying the population? Um, are there businesses we can support that are minority owned perhaps? You know, and not have this just as a wish or an ideal, but if it becomes part of our structure, there will be more parity. It's not going to be solid clad as, as the other Dr. Shabazz was saying, these things aren't perfect, but having different uh, groups, organizations, persons, uh, different constituencies that are representative of our diverse population would benefit everyone. You know, we'd have a diversity of ideas we'd have a diversity of products and services. We'd have a diversity of folks in terms of education that don't just visit here or attend the universities. And then as soon as they finish their degree programs, they want to get out. Or our children, um, after we're living here, once they finish high school, they immediately want to leave and never return, which has been pretty much what happens here for young people of color. So having that lens to everything that we do, again, would benefit not only the people of color, but it would benefit and enrich our whole community. And so that becomes kind of like the center stone, the center of, of uh, our document. And we then go through all the different areas that we foresee um, and can imagine as needing to diversify, such as the business community, right? Um, such as um, when we talk about transportation and housing, all of these things would ultimately benefit this entire community. You know, having housing that is uh, affordable for, you know, working class people. I mean, our students, our grad students, they don't live here. They look for housing outside of Amherst because they can't afford to have any housing here while they're attending the university. And if they have a family, there's, that's even more of a problem trying to find housing. So they live on, on els elsewhere. They go to Holyoke. They, they go to other areas. Those are dollars that could be spent here in this community. So that's why we wrote it. That's why we tried to make it as comprehensive as we could. What we didn't, what you won't see in that, Jeff and, and everyone, you won't see specific initiatives and projects and programs. Because again, if it's about a participatory process of the people, we want some advisory group that's made up ideally of the elders who have the longevity and the knowledge and the experience here in this community. Um, and we want young people who are looking towards the future and the future to imagine what might this community look like if I wanted to stay here. We want them to be the main part of the advisory group. You know, there'll be others in between, but we would like an advisory group that, that would be made up of elders and young people to then guide different initiatives and projects. Because oftentimes what happens in municipalities is that, oh, this is the project you want us to fund, such as the $80,000 that's proposed by the town manager. And it's a one, it's a one off type of situation. So um, that's what you won't see in the document are specific projects and programs because we want that to be, we want the document to be generative and for folks to begin thinking and imagining what that community will look like. And so we made it <laughs> for the town council and the town manager because we want it to be measurable, quantifiable, for next year when we're evaluating, 
Has our town manager done anything different? Has he improved this community for people of color? So that's, that's why we created it as such. Yeah. So I'm noticing the time here, uh, Dee, and I, it's, uh, oh. we, how quick the hour has gone by. Um, thank you all. I want to thank you. For, uh, I wonder, Brother Shabazz, can you stay with us a while, a little bit longer? Sure. Great. Thank you very much, Dee. Really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you, Dee. Thank I you, Dee. Hi. <laughs> I think we're going to open it up to questions now. Jamie, is that okay with you? Okay. Karen, um, unmute yourself if you would and see if we can have some question and answer period. These are questions that came in through the chat. Um, okay. While uh, for the over the last hour, Karen has been uh, hopefully distilling them and let's see what we got. Yeah. So hi, everybody. And thank you um, both both Shabazz's for just a beautiful, wonderful, rich conversation. Um, there are two primary questions, and in some ways you have both addressed them a little bit, but maybe we could elaborate. Amy Middleman asked, what would be the steps to establish a civilian review board for the policing? Um, Shabazz, I see that you put some comments and references to other municipalities and their processes and practices. I wonder if just for the benefit of those who um, learn better by listening and not reading, sure. if you could just um, comment on that a little bit more. Sure, thank you. So what, what it's essentially, essentially it gets to is when you're, when you're really trying to create a, a new structure within town government, especially one that can be effective, especially one that can have some teeth, uh, and, and accomplish something, it, the, the question becomes, what's the authorization? You know, what authorizes this body to come by? We have a planning board that is so, you know, such a powerful force within our town because it has authority behind it. It has the authority of the charter. It has the authority of, of town government, whether from back in the days of town meeting to the select board to now a town council. It has, it has authority that, you know, if you're not, you know, doing things the way they say, your building can't go up or the change you propose can't happen or whatever. Um, and, 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 and so you have to ask the question of the authority that would be behind a civilian review board, a commission on police practices, call it what you will. And so that issue of authority, as I've seen it, rests upon either uh, two different things. And one is the, um, uh, the, the, the town's legislative body, uh, the city council, the town council can authorize the creation of a new facet of, of city government, of town government. Um, and uh, that seems to be the way Northampton has proceeded. Uh, that in, in con collection, connection with its mayor uh, council form of government, it has decided to create uh, a type of civilian review board, citizen review board, what have you. And um, they've selected 15 people and now they're getting about the task of looking at things like how can we redirect the funds? How can we come up with a different budget? How can we uh, 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 defund and, and, and refund uh, uh, fund some, some new initiatives that are, are not based on sworn officers who are licensed to kill. Um, so, with, so that's one way. Another way is um, I have a, a cousin of mine, a first cousin of mine in San Diego. She's an attorney there. She's been in the fight a long time. They went the route of getting a charter, an amendment to the city uh, charter of San Diego. And so the people, they put a, a ballot measure out there. The people went to the polls and uh, there was an overwhelming vote in support of amending the charter to create a body that they called a commission on police practices. And that body then is, has, has an articulated mission, uh, a scope of activities, uh, in, and which include investigatory power, includes the ability, they don't have the power to discipline an officer. 
to discipline anyone on the police force, but they are empowered to fully investigate it, to have the right to look at personnel documents, to have the right to interview people, the right to subpoena materials that they need, and then they can render a, a recommendation that goes to the chief, that goes to the, the, the town government about certain practices, or if it's a chokehold, if it's, you know, putting a knee on someone's neck, or if it's uh, certain ways of restraining people, if it's, uh, um, you know, issues of, of uh, profiling, uh, if it's issues of, uh, of, of how, of, of not having uh, um, law enforcement officers be the first one to go out to a noise complaint. They can be the body that hears and vets those, those issues and then make recommendations that then are, are to be carried out, that then can be debated and voted and carried out by the council, by, you know, and, and the council in directing the town manager and the chief to implement. So, you know, the first question I think you have to grapple with in creating such a group is which way are we going? And um, in some ways, I think, given the legacy of Amherst as a town, I'm not opposed to thinking about a charter amendment. I don't know fully all the process. Uh, Dia said we're not lawyers here, but there must be some process by which you can amend this charter that we just voted in less than two years ago. And uh, so I'd like, so first thing I'd like to hear, have a conversation on is, is a charter amendment process and whether um, uh, that is perhaps the way to go. Or the other way is again to, uh, with our manager council form of government, to have them uh, authorize uh, a body, um, to authorize such a commission, to then uh, create the, uh, uh, the mission and, and scope of what it is able to do, what it is charged with doing, and then appointing the people who then serve on that on that body uh, to begin to do the work. So there's a lot to go in that. There's a lot that goes into this if you're going to do it right and if you're going to create something that has uh, that has juice and can and can uh, 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 bring the change we want. Thank you very much. I'm going to insert a question that we didn't get to that, in my mind, follows from this um, this last question and what you just shared. The JCA TEDEC initiative wants to stay current and connected to the work of the Racial Equity Amherst Task Force, including becoming more engaged with these very processes and, and different options of processes that you're describing. What is the best way for us to stay connected? That's a really good question. Um, you, you know, Respecting the, uh, the, the representational system we have here, one thing would be to kind of uh, look at your, 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 you know, where you are in different uh, districts, different precincts, who your counselors are, and, um, you know, and really work to, to, to pull their ear uh, um, on, uh, on some of the changes and some, on some of the, the issues that are being debated and, and to weigh in with them to, to hopefully carry forth. One thing I can say, and, and you know, you follow my post or whatever, sometimes it looks like I'm, I'm always complaining and beating up on, on <laughs> some of our elected officials. And hey, I've been in the, I've been in the hot seat myself. So that I, I feel like, hey, you, you're there, it comes with the territory. But, uh, but I am imp somewhat impressed over this summer uh, that there, there has been a degree of responsiveness, uh, at least in about half, half of the council. You know, I see about six of them that really uh, seem to me, and it's not because they voted the way I, I wanted them to vote, but I just listened to them. I just listened, just profound listening. And I see them, it, seemed to, it seems to me, uh, trying to hear what their constituency is saying, what their, you know, what they're hearing. And, um, and, 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 and it seems to sometimes reverse their opinions on things. It seems to sometimes inform the, the positions they take on things. So I would say that's, that's one strategy is to, um, uh, and I'm sure you've, you know, already on, you know, probably doing that. And, and I encourage you to continue. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, the, the, 
the strategy of coalition building and, and thinking about how, in a very open and transparent way, you know, we have one uh, official political action committee in this, in this town that uh, have gone through the process of being registered uh, uh, as a political action committee, able to raise money and, and, uh, and, and work then to uh, field candidates and influence people uh, uh, who, who are, are, are in, in governmental positions. And I really find for a, a town like ours and from its history, from, as I've observed uh, and as I've read over its history, I, I think it's, it's really a corrosive force. I like the editorial that, that someone wrote. I can't pull his name right now, but but he wrote and, and he thought also this was a very, a very bad and corrosive uh, move for our town. But, you know, on the other hand, at least they're honest. At least they, they state, you know, forthrightly that, that they're here to, to fight for a certain vision of, of, uh, of the town. They're here to fight for a certain uh, 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 role of, for, for developers and people in real estate and whatnot to, to, uh, to exercise over, uh, uh, over the town. And, um, and so you gotta, you gotta at least uh, acknowledge that, that they're being forthright in what they're about. But on the other hand, how do we, the rest of us move forward? And, um, and I think that uh, for me, uh, it is to we just it, lost it, you. It is to try to look at coalition building. Can you hear me, Aaron? Again? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just all of a sudden stopped being able to hear. I didn't hear Shabazz's last two sentences. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Shabazz, I can't hear you. I hope you're not still talking. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt you. Nope, I have good. one last question from the yeah. chat, and this is from Judy Glazer, who said, and again, this has been addressed somewhat, Dee mentioned planning for a people's assembly, and she wanted to learn more about this. I see that Aaron Berman did post the link to the Ekbal Atmod lecture at Hampshire College that you referenced, and so people can save the chat and read that later. But if there is more that you would like to share, Shabazz, about your vision about a people's assembly in Amherst and how we moving forward may be able to really start to hear more voices. Okay, very good. Um, so yes, thanks for, for posting that link. Um, I think that it, it's continuing to evolve. I just would say stay tuned. Uh, we're gonna be working on this and we'll be announcing opportunities for, for people to uh, to connect uh, with those efforts. Something that was mentioned as well in terms of um, a uh, native, a kind of somewhat native son of Amherst, uh, William Darity uh, and uh, uh, Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen uh, just published a book a few months ago on From Here to Equality, uh, Reparations for uh, Blacks in America in the 21st Century. Great book, we had a conversation on it uh, ourselves that's on Amherst Media Archive on Amherst Media. Um, and if you read their book and you listen to them in, uh, on that, on that uh, conversation or in others, they very much stress that the term reparations should be reserved for the campaign at the federal level to, um, uh, uh, to repair the harm of, of, uh, of slavery and um, uh, and and anti-black racism, um, and the argument for that is compelling. Um, the first of all, state and local governments do not have the fiscal base to begin to uh, 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 pay reparations that could meaningfully work close the wealth gap, the the wealth gap of African Americans in terms of wealth formation. So uh, uh, that that was um, with that was held back from from uh, slavery and anti-black racism. So um, and for other reasons, it's also compelling. The federal government is the body that that authorized, that sanctioned, that legitimized, and 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 protected as an interstate, as a national uh, uh, practice, uh, the practice of slavery. So uh, for example, I'm here in Amherst. And Dee and I are here from, and our ancestors, and, and our ancestors that go back into the times of slavery, 
uh, were from Texas and Louisiana. So most of the harm that our ancestors experienced were, was there, but we're here. So again, to say Amherst should, should you know, what, what Amherst should do or what, or what uh, 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 relative to that, you can see there's, it, it, it's a federal issue. It's not a, mm -hmm. it's not a direct state and local issue. Um, so I, I, I accept that. And I would prefer to think of the racial and equity, uh, the racial equity and, and, and uh, 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 restorative justice kinds of uh, initiatives and things that we, we have proposed in the document uh, to the town council um, and, and in other things that we're proposing that, um, you know, no, I wouldn't see them directly uh, as, as reparations. Um, okay. Reparations can be a local word. The upcoming talk we're having tomorrow with uh, Reverend Robert Turner in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that is a case, and, and the Darity Mullen would have to recognize and do recognize that is a legitimate fight for reparations. Uh, there are uh, people who were, uh, uh, who are still alive today from 1921, whose families were directly impacted by the massacre, by the, uh, uh, that massacre there in, in 1921. Um, there are not many left, you know, and they, they would have been very young at the time, but, uh, uh, but the point remains, there are people or their immediate descendants who are still alive and, and were still affected and never allowed to sue, never allowed mm -hmm. to get um, uh, any form of reparations. And that is a fight that, that is ongoing there in, in Tulsa. Um, so, you know, there, there are cases like that, but in general, uh, I agree. It is a federal policy best represented uh, legislatively at this point by the bill HR 40 that uh, Sheila Jackson Lee of Houston is the author of that has been co-signed by both our, uh, our uh, by uh, Representative McGovern, uh, that has been uh, the Senate version by Cory Booker, has been signed on to by both uh, Elizabeth Warren and by uh, um, uh, Ed Markey. So, you know, we, we, we're there and, uh, and I do, do correctly agree that that's, uh, that's where we have to keep the focus on what what reparations is, but there still is local work of rememory, local work of um, uh, of restorative justice, local work of uh, that that we can uh, we can call by other names. Jamie, why don't you uh, wrap things up here for us? Certainly, I just want to thank you so heartily on behalf of the JCA Zedek Initiative. This has been such a meaningful conversation. I. Uh, we learned so much and your insights and, and really the passion, the call to action um, that I'm, I'm moved by and uh, I don't think I'm alone. So I hope this is the beginning of many conversations and unified action and um, make this Amherst, our home, a better place for all. <laughs>